Good evening. Good evening. Hope everybody's well. Warm at least. At least there's a warm place to come this evening. So um, we got a few more days uh, of cold weather. A little warmer tomorrow. It'll be in the 20s, not the teens. So uh, just a touch warmer tomorrow. Warms up a little bit the next couple of days and it's cold over the weekend. So we get a warm, warm blast after that. This time next week it'll be in the 60s. So uh, is this welcome to Georgia, right? Uh, that's right, we tropical weather. So, uh, but good to have you with us tonight. We're going to continue on in our study of First John, and uh, we might make it through verse four tonight. So, uh, I hope that's the plan. That's the goal uh, as we get through. So, hopefully, everybody came in. You got a sheet. You're going to be able to kind of follow along and what we're talking about and what we're doing this evening as we continue in First John. So uh, I'll open us up in prayer, and then we will dive in, and we will get started. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for just the opportunity you've given us to study your word and continue to do so. As, as I study and as I read, I'm thankful for your word. And Father, I do uh, pray for those folks in, in many other places in the world who only have pieces and parts of scripture, pieces and parts of the word. Uh, and Father, we are so blessed to be able to contain the full word, all 66 books. And so, Father, may we not take that for granted, but may we uh, be thankful for uh, just the gift that you've given us in your word. And may we be uh, take advantage of that as we study and as we learn. Uh, and in doing so, Father, may that allow us to continue to grow closer to you. We thank you for uh, just uh, all that's taking place here tonight. We pray for our... Uh, Kids who are in Awana, we ask that you would be with them and the Awana workers as they um, continue to help our kids learn scripture and hide uh, your word in their heart. We pray for our youth tonight as they're studying. Uh, Father, that you would give them the ability to comprehend and understand and apply uh, the, the lessons from scripture as well tonight. Um, Lord, so be with us as we do the same and uh, may we sense your presence and your spirit move among us as we study your word. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's continue where we are, where we were last week, and hopefully everybody kind of got a uh, a sheet to follow along um, as we go through. Is I as we talk about John, um, hopefully it becomes more than just a book of passages that we're studying, but hopefully it becomes uh, an understanding of who John is as we continue to walk through the book of First John. Uh, we learned that John was about. Um, John, First John was written in what what year do we think? Nine. Uh, A.D. Ninety A.D. Right, and uh, was written somewhere uh, in what area? Ephesus. Ephesus. Now, I'm asking those questions. Why do we think those are important? Why do you think it's important that we know when and where it was written? Okay, give some credence to it, absolutely. What else? It gives a historical stamp. Okay, so it allows you to know where in history things have taken place. Okay, so we have credence in history. Any Anything else? Any other reason? Well, we know he wasn't on Patmos, you know. Right. Because that's where Revelation is written. Right. Context, so historical context, context and knowing. It puts a place as to what the book was written and you know Revelation. The other thing that's important is you understand that if it was written in 90 AD, Christ died, give or take, what year? 33. He rose in what year? 33, right? Just want to make sure we were all together on that. Yeah, so he died and rose, was crucified and rose again in the year about 33 AD. Um, and so some 60 years later is when John began to write the books. And he wrote five books. What are those books? First, second, third John, yep. Gospel of John, and Revelation. There you go. First, second, third John, Gospel of John. And Revelation. What was the last book that he wrote that we know of? The Gospel of John, right? Yeah. So uh, when you begin to put these things in context, you begin to understand 
how they're written and, and what's going on. And so last week we kind of started with the first four verses of 1 John. Let's take a look at that. So if you want to go ahead and uh, turn into, take your Bible and turn to 1 John chapter 1. We're going to take a look at these first four verses uh, as we go through. And so we're going to continue tonight in our study of the word of life. And so this is part two of that particular study. So uh, let's start with 1 John. Here we go. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. A lot was going on in the world. We talked a lot about that last week. And so a lot of the things that were taking place are the beliefs of many other religions, many other sects, many other areas where folks decided that they wanted to take pieces and parts from Christianity and then make it their own. Does that sound familiar even in Old Testament times when we studied it uh, in Amos? That's very familiar back in that period of time as well. And so lots has happened, lots has gone on. We talked specifically last week, Just to, we just touched on it, so I want to kind of finish that as we start tonight on the Gnostics. Now, the Gnostics uh, were a very interesting group in that they believed that Jesus Christ was not God in the flesh. They actually believed that he was just a phantom. He was just a spirit, but not God in the flesh. And so um, when you look at that, that became a very popular belief in the first and second centuries, particularly in the church of the area where John was ministering. And John was there to help continue to spread the good news of the gospel. And so um, you have a particular portion of that where Gnosticism got started uh, was from what we call a docetic heresy. And docetic heresy taught just that, that Christ only appeared as a spirit, but was a man without flesh. And so uh, that comes from the Greek word uh, deseo, uh, which means to appear or seem so. Now, I'm not testing you on that Greek word. We're going to cover other Greek words tonight. So, But that one uh, in particular means to appear or seem to just appear but have no flesh to it. And so what started the Gnostics down their particular path was Simon the Magician. Now Simon the Magician if you don't know his story, you can take your scripture and let's turn all the way back to Acts. And when we look at Acts, we're going to go specifically to Acts chapter 8 and look at verses 9 through 24 um, of Acts chapter 8. And that is where we find the beginnings of Gnosticism. So Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 9, it says this, A man named Simon had been a sorcerer or magician, uh, you could put there, had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. But now the people believe Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. So in this picture, you can see that they were listening to Simon, Simon the magician. They thought he was great. He was doing great things. And now up on the scene comes Philip. Philip is sharing the good news of the gospel. People believed 
the good news of the gospel and began to repent from what they were doing and to accept <coughs> Jesus Christ. And so as a part of that, as a result, many, many women were baptized. Now, as we move forward, Simon now would see that as really kind of an affront on what he was trying to do. So let's go ahead. So Simon comes up with this idea. He says, then Simon believed himself and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went. He was amazed by the signs and great miracles that Philip performed. So when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. So they came in and sent some reinforcements in. And as soon as they, Peter and John, arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for if they had only been bat for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, May your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord, and perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Pray to the Lord for me, Simon exclaimed, that these terrible things you've said won't happen. So the image you've got is that Simon's been watching, he's been seeing what's going on, and now he has this great idea that if I, ask, if I give them money, then they're going to tell me how they're doing this trick so that other people can receive the Holy Spirit. Simon was not fully convinced of who Jesus Christ was and what he was doing. Simon was not fully convinced that Jesus Christ was man in the flesh. And so from those particular beliefs and traditions, Simon now receives a rebuke from Peter that we just saw. And so after that happens, as you study a little bit of history, Simon began claiming that he was the great God who had come down from heaven and that his, that accompanying him was a prostitute named Helena who was his first creation. So Simon went way off the rails from even what we're seeing in scripture and decided that he was going to claim himself to be as great as God. And not only that, he created this lady to be his own prostitute, named her Helena, and that was his first creation. Simon was in Rome, so if we went back and looked at the timeline, which we're not going to do tonight, but Simon was in Rome at the time uh, under uh, Claudius Caesar, uh, and he was the emperor who preceded Nero, by the way, um, if you're tracking all this in time. And Simon, really be because of this and because of his belief or disbelief in Jesus Christ, they give him a lot of credit for starting the Gnostic belief uh, that has now permeated the world. And so uh, he had such an impact, by the way, that the Romans made a statue of him that bore the inscription to Simon, the holy God. Yeah. So Rome was way off base, which, which, I mean, that shouldn't surprise anybody. Rome was way off base. They saw these magic and sorcerer type things that Simon was doing. Simon began to claim he was this great guy. Of course, the Romans don't know any better, and so now the Romans give him credit as a holy God. Simon the magician's uh, basic Gnostic heresy wasn't alone. After him, you had numerous copycats who came right after him, other sorcerers, other magicians who came in and other teachers and groups who attempted to mix those pagan religions um, with Eastern mysticism, and then also, and I find it funny this how it's worded, 
but the philosophy of Christianity in order to improve on what they believe were Christianity's unsophisticated doctrine. So even in 90 AD, people thought that Christianity was unsophisticated. They thought it was not anything worth believing in and all those types of things. And so people began to mix in all the things that they wanted to mix in there. Um, and so most of the Gnostic groups of that time, even through now, believe that the physical world is evil, um, but this world and everything in it was not the good work of a true spiritual God. So you have to watch what they're saying, because if you look at that, yeah, I agree, this world is evil. And then they come in and they say, well, this world would be right if everybody would believe in a spiritual God. But remember their basic premise of belief is what about Jesus Christ? He's a spirit. So when they use the term spiritual, they're not referring to Christ in the flesh. They're referring to some other, couldn't really be God, some other spiritual being other than God himself. And so they, they twist those words, just as Satan has done many, many times since Genesis 3, um, to make people believe. So John, this is what John was up against in the region of Ephesus, the seven churches of Revelation, all that over in Asia Minor. That is exactly what John was up against when he was teaching and writing his books. And so when we look at these particular examples and we look at 1 John in particular, that is why John starts the way that he does. That is why John talks about those particular things. Now, last week... I told you there were five items, particularly five things that you could count on as being true about the word of life. And so let's kind of see if you remember the first two from last week. Those are the first two blanks that you've got. Uh, the very first item that you have on there is that the word of life is what? Unchangeable, right? So the word of life is unchangeable. And we talked about that word of life being unchangeable. You need another sheet? There you go. Yes, ma'am. You got one. There you go. So the word of life is unchangeable. And by unchangeable, what did we mean? The very nature of unchangeable means what? Not going to change. Going to be the same. And so what is one of the attributes of God is that he is the same. All right, does that sound like unchangeable to you? Yeah, it sounds pretty much like unchangeable to me. So we learned through that very first part of the first verse that the word of life is unchangeable. It's not going to change despite what other people believe. Just because they believe it doesn't make it true. So... The second item that we have on there is that the word of life is historical. historical, and through that we saw many accounts as to what John experienced. And so John was an eyewitness. John saw and experienced. He was with Christ for his years of ministry, and he saw all that happened. As a matter of fact, John was there when Christ was crucified, and Christ told John what? Take care of his mother, right? So behold, John, your mother, etc. So, um, yes, so there's you have that. And then John also was one of the first disciples to the tomb and went in and looked and believed that Christ had risen from the dead from that point. John was an eyewitness to all of those things. He wrote those down, compared them with the other disciples, and all of those things line up. And uh, that has been accounted for as a true, historical, accurate record of Jesus Christ. And so the word of life is historical, and you see those types of things that you can count on. And so that brings us today, well, one more thing to end with that. As I said, the word of life is historical. We talked that through that we learned that Jesus Christ was the God-man who was fully divine and fully human. Um, and so John experienced all of those things. And so that brings us to our third item tonight, and that is the word. All right, so that's historical, and then that brings us to the word of life is communicable. 
meaning it's relatable and you can communicate that to others. And so tonight we're going to take a look at how is that really true? How, how do we do that and how did John set that example up? How is it truly communicable? And so let's take a look again at um, as we go through. Uh, you have a chart in front of you and that chart in front of you is a nice circle and it's got arrows that point north, south, east, and west. And we're going to use this circle tonight. You're going to fill it in, and we're going to talk about the different things that John proclaimed and experienced with Jesus Christ and those types of things that he has then since communicated. So if you go back and you look at the first verse or so of John 1, when you look at that verse... Um, you have many things that were proclaimed. So the very first thing that John proclaimed, in the center there, we proclaim. And so this verse starts very simply. Uh, in that first verse, it says, we proclaim. Who is we in that passage? The apostles, right? So you've got we as in the apostles. We proclaim. And so they've had 60 years worth of time to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. And so we proclaim, and then they proclaimed four different things. The very first thing that they proclaimed is, and that may be a little hard. Can I read that? Let me turn to the little side. They, they proclaim what we have heard. That's the very first item over there on the left. What we have heard was their first proclamation. Um, as we look at what we have heard, you know, John, if you, if you have read his gospel, if you understand uh, he was with Christ, he heard the parables straight from Christ. He heard sermons. He heard even private words of instruction or counsel or just encouragement from Christ himself. Um, but when we look a little deeper, it's not just that he heard. And so... I'm going to, um, if I mess up the English lesson, uh, mom can meet me in the parking lot afterwards and, <laughs> and straighten me out. But when we look at this term, the term is have heard. And so if you want to underline that, etc. But have heard, this translates, if you look at scripture, into what I would call a perfect tense. Now, this perfect tense is meant to relay that he's heard it before. It's something he's heard over and over and over again. So it's completed with something that happened in the past, because John's writing it some 60 years later. So it's an occurrence or things that have happened in the past. We have heard. However, it has an impact on the present. Okay? Did I get that right? Wow. Wow. Okay, it's tough having your mom as an English teacher. You're standing up here giving an English lesson. I don't know the first thing about it. So um, anyway, so you've got John who's now said we have heard. So he's experienced and heard these things in the past. He's writing them down. But what he has heard has had an ongoing impact on him in the present. So we have heard these things, and John didn't merely just hear it once or twice or a couple of times, but he heard it throughout Christ's ministry. So that's the first item. We have heard, or what we have heard. The second item on here, I've got two more extra blanks in there than I should have. All right, so the second item is what we have seen. So straight across the circle, it goes, what we have seen, all right? So we can take the same logic that we applied to have heard and apply that same logic to have seen. So again, not only did John now hear and the other apostles, because remember the center, we proclaim. So not only did John proclaim and hear and listen what he had heard, but now he's proclaiming what they have seen. And again, he saw it in the past, he experienced in the past, still had an impact on his life as he went forward. Have seen. Um, again, perfect tense, completed an action in the present with an ongoing impact. 
Um, if you look, some versions say, or most versions should say too, not just that they have seen, but they have seen with what? If you were to look at that passage. 1 John 1. Their very eyes. With their own eyes, right? So it's not a description of maybe what others have seen, and they're like, well, we've seen it, but we've seen it through somebody else. They saw it, they heard it themselves, they saw it with their own eyes, so they understood what the physical flesh Christ looked like. They walked with him, they saw him minister with their own eyes, and again, he was not referring that we've seen some spirit or some ghost as the Gnostics were wanting to spread that out across the globe, he is referring to we have seen with our own eyes the physical account of Jesus Christ. The third one is we have looked at what we have looked at. And so on this one, if you'll notice, you've got a little box now off to the side of we have looked at. So across the top, you've got a box that's hanging out to the right for a minute. And so when we look at this, we've already talked about, well, John said he saw what was going on. So why is he reiterating the fact that we looked at? Because in the Greek, there's a very specific difference between seeing something and looking at something. And so in this particular passage, this look at is more than a glance. When you walk past a bookstore, if you're not really an avid reader, are you going to just look at and glance at the titles and move on? Or are you going to pick up a book and go, oh, that looks interesting, and start looking at what's in it and read the cover, read the back jacket? What are you going to do? If you're an avid reader, you're going to be there a while. You're going to sit there. So does that mean you've just seen it or are you really looking at that book in great detail? You go buy a new car. They tell you to look at the owner's manual. Does that mean you pull it out, look at the cover and put it back in the glove box? I'm not asking what you do. I'm not asking for a confession. I'm just asking if you go buy a vehicle, they're going to tell you to do what? Look at that owner's manual. Do they tell you to just pull it out, look at it, and shove it back? Or are they expect you to open it, digest it, read it, and understand it? His term right here is looked at. We have looked at. Uses a Greek word. And that Greek word, and I'm going to put it up here because, uh, is translated from the Greek. And it is theaomai. Theome, and I'm not going to say that I had to put my own phonetical uh, pronunciation out there, uh, but it really means to see or to look closely at. And once you've seen it and looked closely at it, you're going to perceive it or understand what it's telling you. So when John is saying this about we have seen, and then the next one is we have looked at, John is saying not only have we seen what he's done, we've been there with him. We've looked at, we've studied what Christ has said. We've studied what Christ has done for us. We were there when Christ was crucified. We were there when he rose from the grave. We were there when we walked with him on this earth. We were there in the fishing boat with him. When he calmed the storm, we were there when he fed the 5,000. We were there when, on and on and on, seeing Christ in the flesh. They looked at, they studied, they understood, they perceived what it meant to follow Christ. Now, if you look at the New King James Version, so the New King James Version takes that and uses a very different word. So they use the word beheld. So when scripture talks about John beheld, John didn't just glance at and go, oh, hey, that's great. John looked at, studied, and understood. An example of that passage is in John 1, 14. The Gospel of John, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the word became flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory. When you're looking at God and you're studying his scripture and you have an encounter with God, is that, hey, that's great, I just had an encounter with God and you move on? Or are you beholding that moment and trying to soak up as much as you can and be in his presence as much as you can? That's what this is talking about here. We beheld, we looked at, we understood and perceived what was going on. So the same is true here. Um, when you look at other passages, uh, Jesus performed many works that I just kind of talked out and, uh, and gave you for a minute. The other apostles watched him intently. They saw lots of things that were just realities of who Christ was when you were following him. He is Lord and God, Messiah and Savior, um, and he has supernatural powers over demons, disease, nature, death, and all those things they saw. Not only did they see that, but they saw his authority to forgive sin. Nobody else had that authority but Christ, and they saw it and experienced it. They also saw his authority to grant eternal life. Nobody else had that authority. So when we look at this passage, and we're looking at the first part of that, they saw and understood. And not only that, there was plenty of proof that Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 and 17. It says, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. John 14, verses 8 through 11. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. They've seen, they've looked at, and are understanding or trying to understand who Christ is. And then 60 years later, John, along with the other apostles, are writing about that. Last one, last bullet, so to speak. So we have heard, we have seen, we have looked at, and now we have touched what we have touched. The word here, again you have a block now off to the left, the word here is um, selah ao, and if you're like, what is that? Let me put it up here for you. Um, and so, uh, you didn't get that from what I said, right? The spelling is way off from what I said. But, that is the Greek word. Now if you take that Greek word, and we talk about touch, how many of you, either you yourself could be guilty, and I'll raise my hand, you go in and you see these like pillows that are like super squishy and kids can't keep their hands off of them. You're walking through a store and they're touching them, or maybe you're touching them because they look super squishy and squeezy. They pick one up and they squeeze it and they're feeling all over it. That's the meaning of this word here. It means to feel with intensity. That's what this Greek word means, to feel with intensity, or to grope something like a blind man would do who had no vision whatsoever, but was trying to feel every ounce of something so he could get a mental picture of what was going on. 
So when we look at this particular example and we're looking, these disciples hung out with Jesus all the time. You can't tell me that the camaraderie that they had and the time they spent together, they didn't just they just didn't walk down the side of the road. Sure, guys are going to be guys. You know, they're going to be doing things. John refers to himself as the one who leaned on Christ during the Lord's Supper. Um, they had companionship with him. Um, and when we get past the crucifixion, past the resurrection, Christ appears to the disciples after that. And when he appears to the disciples, he talks specifically um, to those disciples, and he tells them in Luke 24, 39, he says, look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me. That is the same Greek word that we just looked at in 1 John 4. Touch me. Don't just pat it and let that be good enough. I'm telling you, touch me. Make sure that I am not a ghost. Referencing the Gnostics who were starting to spread all these lies that Christ was not Christ in the flesh. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies. And as you see, I do. Look at the next passage that I've got there for you. John 20 and 27. It also says, Then he said to Thomas, very specifically here, Put your finger here and see my hand. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Don't disbelieve, but believe. When we talk about touching, we're talking about not just a, yeah, that's okay. We're talking about, here, stick your finger in my hand. Stick your hand in my side. I am the Christ. I am the one who died on the cross for you and rose again on the third day to have victory over death, hell, and the grave. Don't disbelieve it. I'm here. I'm in the flesh. Believe in me. John experienced that as well as the other apostles. And it was very important that as he experienced that, that he capture that moment, not just as a quick touch, but as a, here, look for yourself and see who I am. When we look at all of those things, so you have a we proclaim in the middle, you have a we have heard, we have seen, we have looked at, and we have touched. Combining all those things, that leads us to now the manifestation. And so if we go back to part of that verse in John, it talks about Christ being manifested. Now, when we looked at that manifestation, um, we just tried to define what that was last week. And so right here, we're talking about was manifested is what you see in 1 John. Uh, right there in the first couple of verses, was manifested. We're on to verse 2, I believe. Uh, and was translated from the Greek word. And the Greek word is phanaru, is how you would pronounce that, phanaru. And so phanaru, P-H-A-N-E-R-O-O. -O, um, and it means to reveal, to reveal or make visible what was hidden. So, when we talk about all this circle and we talk about the fact that we proclaim, we defined earlier that that we proclaim are the apostles. That's what that we means. And we proclaim all these things about Christ. We've written the four Gospels. We've written our experience. We've written our eyewitness accounts. And... Because of all these things, we are now making manifest. We are now making visible what was hidden. We are now revealing, just as Christ revealed himself to us in those three years of ministry that he did with the disciples. But the proclamation doesn't have to stop. So if you remember, our third point is the word of life is what? Communicable, which means it's able to be communicated, right? We 
have that same ability to proclaim Christ today? Have we seen the word of life? How have we seen him? Spiritually. Through scripture? Spiritually, right? Uh, Have we heard and seen? Now the harder questions. Have you looked at the word of life? And I don't mean just glance on a Sunday morning when you come to church. Have you looked at the word of life? Have you studied scripture? Are you continuing to study scripture? Studying what has happened with a current present impact. Have heard, have seen, have looked, have touched physical scripture. We have the same ability to proclaim the gospel as the disciples did. And I would say we have the same responsibility to proclaim the gospel as the disciples did. So what was manifested, what was revealed to us what was made visible. And when we look at those particular examples, um, I think I have another blank for y'all under that. Um, We have another set of Greek words that go with that. And so when you look at that passage, um, particularly when you look at uh, verse 2, verse 2 starts with the life. Okay? Now, When we talk about the life, there are a couple of things that could happen with that. And so, for John, the word of life became manifested, revealed to him as he experienced and walked this earth with Christ. And that manifestation became really his proclamation uh, of truth. Now, that manifestation for me, when I'm looking at that, was not what we call a biological life. So when we look here and it says the life, the Greek word here is not, it is not bios. So there's a Greek word bios, which means your physical life, your physical presence on earth. That is not the word here. The word here, when you go back and translate, is zoe, is what it is. And so um, Z-O-E, But it refers to three things. It refers to life that is eternal, life that is heavenly, and life that is divine. So that Greek word there is not talking about our physical life. It is talking about the life, the eternal life, the heavenly life, the divine life of the word that is manifested in Christ. When a person has seen that word of life in the flesh, then the only response that they can have is to testify, proclaim, to communicate that to others. The proclamation of the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Christ is, when you look at this life, Scripture refers to him as several things. The first thing scripture refers to him as is as the bread of life. John 6, 48, the bread of life. It also refers to him in John eleven twenty five as the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. The resurrection and the life. And then John 14, 6, refers to him as the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me or through Christ. The proclamation of the gospel. One more verse there, Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To communicate the word of life is to share them with them the hope of salvation that can only be found. 
in Christ. Alright. Two more points. Right? And I'm not going to take near as long as I did for this one. We're going to get through them. So, the fourth item, the fourth thing that the word of life is, is that it is relational. Alright? So this becomes a little easier to understand because if you understand that the word of life is communicable, meaning we can share it with others, we have that ability, we should proclaim. If you're sharing that with others, you are now going to make that relational. You're going to make that where it is truly an opportunity to have a relationship with Christ. Now, as we look at this passage... There is also <clears throat> another set of Greek words that go with that. And so when we talk about it, uh, you can flip your sheet over to the back, number four. Uh, the word of life is relational. The first thing we want to look at is this, is from this particular passage. A lot of folks think about the word, when you, there's another word we use at church all the time, particularly Baptist, when we talk about relational. And what would that word be? Fellowship. Fellowship, right? Now, how would you define fellowship? Having coffee and donuts. Having coffee and donuts. <laughs> All right, there's one answer. <laughs> what else? How would you define fellowship? Developing relationships, hanging out together. Okay, developing relationships, hanging out together. Talking to people. Talking to people, okay. Okay, so you're being, you're being southern and polite by saying how you doing, but I really didn't want to hear all that. You just give me the answer back. No, that could be. Maybe. Some folks might consider that a fellowship. So the word fellowship is used a lot. Now, when you see it in Scripture, Scripture coats, um, particularly in John, with the word fellowship. But I'm going to tell you in this passage, when we look at John, and you go through verse 3 is where we are now, chapter 1 and verse 3, when we look at that, it says, That which you have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship. That word fellowship, though, does not mean hanging out, having coffee, what have you. The Greek word for fellowship is going to change that definition. It says, and indeed, the rest of the verse, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. So in this passage, the word fellowship, which is your first blank there, is from the Greek word. Now, we should know this word. We hear it all the time. Danny used it all the time. It is a very common Greek word. The Greek word is what? You're very good. Look there. You, you win the Greek certificate tonight. Yeah, so koinonia is what that is. So the Greek word is koinonia. Now, when you look at this word and you look at it in the context of what's happening, I don't necessarily like the word fellowship because it doesn't, while it tells you a little bit, it skims the surface of what I really believe this verse means. What I'm looking for in this particular verse is not, hey, let's have coffee, hey, let's sit and chat in the hall, hey, let's just go hang out as friends. That doesn't come close to what John's thinking about in this passage. The word that I would use instead is probably the word communion. Now, when we think communion, we're thinking let's set the elements up and let's pass the elements, but communion is not just an activity we do in church on Sunday. <clears throat> communion is something that allows us to fellowship, to build a deeper relationship with Christ in understanding what he has done for us. And so part of that communion, here's the definition that I would probably use for that. So when we talk about fellowship, really... This word is, it's the outworking, meaning the outward work of a deep spiritual union. 
spiritual union. And I choose that word because it's not just a, hey, I'm calling Christ or God on the phone. And I'm saying, hey, how great are you? Hey, it's great. I've had a good day. Have you got a great day? When you have a spiritual union, you have a spiritual match relationship that is deeper than any other relationship you should have. And so this spiritual union should take place between God and the believer. Spiritual union that should take place between God and the believer as well as between brothers and sisters in Christ. So fellowship is not just limited to our relationship to God or Christ. This deep spiritual union as we travel together and serve together here at North Lake is also a union with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We should all work toward that to make that relational. As believers, and 1 Corinthians, by the way, gives us a good example of that. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, Our God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship. Whom you were called into, replace fellowship with communion. Whom you were called into the communion of his son, Jesus Christ. A deeper, communion tells me it's a deeper relationship. It's not just a surface level relationship. 1 Corinthians 1 9. <clears throat> the last blank that we have, and so if we've been able to talk about the word of life being unchangeable, historical, communicable, relational, when you put all those things together, the word of life is also joyful. The word of life is joyful. And you see that in verse 4. You see that in verse 4. 1 John 1, 4 says, And we, again the apostles, are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Just like the word fellowship could also seem surface level, joy could also have that same connotation. Um, a lot of folks, when they think about joy, they think immediately of emotions and feelings. And I'm feeling great. It's going to be good. Or uh, hey, it's tax season, so I'm going to get some money back on my tax return. I'm, I'm joyful about that. But that's not, again, what we're talking about here. Martin Lloyd-Jones proposes this definition of biblical joy. I don't know if you've heard or have read anything by Martin Lloyd-Jones. I like Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says this, Another thing that we must bear in mind in any definition we may give of New Testament joy is that we do not go to a dictionary. We go to the New Testament instead. This is something quite peculiar, which cannot be explained. It is a quality which belongs to the Christian life in its essence. So that in our definition of joy, we must be very careful that it conforms to what we see in our Lord. The world has never seen anyone who knew joy as our Lord knew it. And yet... He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. So our definition of joy must somehow correspond with that. Skip a couple of pages in the book. I'm, reading, I'm quoting from the book you wrote called Life of Christ, by the way. Um, so you look at this and you go a couple of pages away and he says joy is something very deep and profound. Something that affects the whole and entire personality. It comes to this. There is only one thing that can give true joy, and that is a contemplation of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he satisfies my mind, he satisfies my emotions, he satisfies my every desire. He and his great salvation include the whole personality and nothing less. And only in him am I complete. Joy, in other words, 
is the response and the reaction of the soul to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. When we think about the word of life, and we think about Christ, we think about what he's done for us, that should bring a reaction of true joy. And not just a know him as a surface level, but know him as in you've not only heard him, you've not only seen him, but you have looked at him and have touched him. Let's pray again. Father, we thank you again for your truth and scripture, and may we be uh, encouraged and joyful in the knowledge that we have of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. But Father, may we also be mindful of your um, responsibility you have given us to proclaim the good news of the gospel. For Father, we have the same opportunities to hear and to see and to look upon, study, perceive, and to touch your word each and every day. In doing so, that allows us to grow closer to you, to have a deeper communion with you each and every day. So, Father, just as I'm challenged, may there be others in here that are challenged to uh, make that a daily activity for us, to commune with you, not just fellowship, but to truly get to know you, to understand you. And in doing so, Father, that helps us draw closer to you. So, Lord, may you give us uh, the strength to do that each and every day. May you give us the uh, fire in our bellies, as the, new, as the uh, scripture says, to study and be excited about studying your word.